Welcome back everyone to our home renovation remodel series thing, whatever it is. This time we're doing some more trim. So in the last few episodes, we've been trimming out the sunroom and this time we're gonna do the crown molding. So we're gonna cover uh, making and installing all the crown molding for the sunroom and this one piece here for the breakfast nook area. So in here we have the long wall, which is 18 feet. So I got two of those. Uh, the stock I have is uh, 12 footers, or mostly 12 footers. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna need, by the time I get done with one thing, I'll probably use two sticks, or I'll figure two sticks and have some extras, and then I'll need um, one for either end here. So six sticks total for the, uh, the sunroom. And then I do have a couple of 14 footers, and now allow me to put a 14 footer here with no seam. So before we can actually run the crown, we need to make all the blanks. So let's uh, head down to the shop, take a look at the stock, and start prepping it into crown molding blanks. Woohoo! Wood stuff! Here is the stock that we're going to use. So these are the 12-footers. This is the one 14-footer. And I got this. This is a 5-quarter S2S and straight line one edge. So I can rip my blanks out of these things and kind of go from there. The actual blank final thickness is already there. The blank needs to be an inch thick and four and a quarter wide. And then in the drawings, here is the final profile that we're gonna be creating. So our blank needs to be basically the diagonal. It's gonna be four and a quarter wide so we can run this thing on the flat and create this cove and this OG detail down here. So I'm gonna get things set up and start uh, ripping these all down to their final whip. So there is the stock for the crown, the, I guess the normal stuff, and then the extra long stuff. I got an extra stick of this. I milled up these guys, which are all of my test pieces and setup pieces so I can confirm the molding configuration as I go. Important to have those. So let's, uh, let's talk about the cutters, the profiles, and uh, making your own crown molding, I guess, instead of buying it. Suri so talked about one sort of benefit of making this yourself, and that is being able to make it as you need it, or at least within reason, make it in batches as you go. If you're doing like, I'm gonna do crown molding in only one room, or I'm gonna do my whole house in one go, that's not really a thing you need to worry about, but in our case, we're iterating through the different rooms. You know, the sun room is its own kind of thing right now. Then I have the kitchen breakfast nook and pantry as a secondary thing, part of this sort of area. We have the original part of the house, which we haven't gotten into yet, and then maybe we want some upstairs when we do that too. Don't really know, but at least this way I have the tooling myself and I can make them in batches as I go. And especially with crown molding, we're gonna be taking a lot of material out of the stock, which can have a higher chance of warping and moving it around and moving around. So you can, of course, you can go and you can buy crown molding off the shelf. Suppliers will have like all of their stock crown profiles. This is another option that I could have done. I could have switched to a stock profile, but I really felt that I wanted to stick with the molding profiles that our architect designed for us. Cause uh, you know, why not? <laughs> I guess. The, uh, a lot of the suppliers also be able to do custom mill work. So with that, you would be able to basically buy or have them make for you your special custom knife that they'll then run for you. So you're gonna have the tooling cost and then every time you have a run done, they'll probably charge you a setup fee or something like that. Typically, you're probably looking at two to $300 for the setup and whatever they're gonna charge you to custom grind your knives. So I'm essentially saving, sa saving the setup fees by uh, doing this myself. It also gives you the flexibility that, you know, you can, if you miscut a few of them by accident, you just run down to the shop and make some more. It's less of a big deal than calling it in and being like, okay, I need two more sticks. So that's gonna be $200 for the setup fee again, and then whatever you pay per linear foot to actually have it run. So 
This has seemed like a better solution for me. It gives me that flexibility that I need. The knives, they are three different knives. So you were knives, three different knives. You have the cove molding knife, the actual face knife, and then the two back cutters that are gonna cut the actual spring angle onto the back of that molding. The spring angle on a piece of molding like this is going to be the angle of which it's sitting on the wall versus the ceiling. So in our case here, this is a 45 degree spring angle. So it's just a simple basic uh, angle. It covers, it has the same coverage on the wall as the ceiling. You could have a higher spring angle or a lower spring angle. And that's just gonna depend on what you're looking for. Different uh, ceiling heights can utilize those different spring angles a little bit differently. So with all that being said, these are the profiles that we'll be using here. So we got the actual cove, and then we have the back cutters, which will create our actual profile in here. So this would be the remaining thing left in there using these three different knives to achieve that actual cut. So we'll have two different cuts here for the back. And this is something I wish was a little bit different. So the uh, machine we're gonna use has these index holes on the cutter head, and that allows you to index all of the cutters in the head. Uh, they're at one inch spacing. What would be kind of nice would be if they made these back cutting knives so that the holes index perfectly to the width that we're going for. So with the knives sitting in there, I think you can see that if these holes actually made it so that these ended up four and a quarter apart and perfectly matched for the back cut, that would be a little bit nicer. I can just run my whole piece backside and on the face side and be done. But now I have to run this one, adjust my fence to hit perfectly there, run this one, adjust my fence to hit perfectly there, and then I can switch to the face cutters. But you know, at least if I ever want to run a different width of molding with the same spring angle on it and the same material thickness or relatively similar material thickness, I have these cutters so I can do it. So I'm gonna get these first set in here, get the fence set, and then start running my test pieces to make sure I got this thing set correctly. So I just need to move my fence over a little bit to get rid of this little flat area. because so I want this guy to come in and meet up right at that point. So I don't want this extra little flat here because it'll give me a kind of a weird alignment as I come through on the face cut. So I'm gonna shift my fence over a little bit, but otherwise it should be pretty close.
Okay, so I had a whole sanity check moment here. I went and I got the, uh, the actual instructions for this. And uh, the first cutter, the big one, which I already did, is not intended to go like this. It's actually intended to go like this and have the board run through on edge, which I don't know how or why or whatever, but the angle is a little bit different. So I think I should still be able to salvage this. I'm going to have to run this again and uh, just take a little bit off of this to get the angle correct. Luckily, I didn't do all of my real pieces yet, so I have plenty of bottom support, but I'm going to have to rig up some other fences or something to hold this thing vertically as it goes through the machine, which I wasn't really planning on having to bother with today, but here we are. Less than fun detour. <laughs> so I think it should be back on track now. I gotta reset my second knife. And then we can run that second back cut. So that went pretty quickly. I think like uh, most things in life, once you get past sort of learning curve of how things are supposed to go, get a little bit easier, a little bit faster. Uh, this one I did in one pass. And the machine seemed to do just fine. So that's a nice thing to know. You can do this one at least in one pass. This is, there's no way that's doing one, going in one pass. <laughs> so I'm gonna get set up for this big one here. I need some taller fences on here and yeah, stop.
So I think I got everything set up here. I use my test boards to learn my way through this process. So the first thing is the fences, those heights I was uh, playing with the whole time. So I started with a full height fence that would capture the entire blank, but obviously that wouldn't work because then the feed rollers would be pushing on the fences and trying to roll the blank through the machine at the same time. So I started just playing them down thinner to a height that worked. But then when I got to the bottom of my cut, the uh, profile ends up being, uh, which is this side? Because the profile ends up dropping down. The fence gets in the way and then the rollers can't push on this thing anymore. So I uh, made the, uh, the fence taller and I put some dishes in there where the rollers go. So the rollers can always be pushing on the workpiece the whole time. That was kind of a, the biggest sort of thing I didn't really catch at first, you know, the, the roller height. They got to have room to be able to push down onto the piece. And that brings me to the last, or I guess the other little caveat with this and the rollers. And that is that the profile on here, this side of the profile gets cut deeper than this side. So as you get down lower into the profile, uh, at a certain point, the flat disappears and you have just this little point here for the rollers to press on. And this actually disappears below the surface of the other flat area. So at a certain point, because the rollers are flat, they don't do this. They're only pushing on this side of the profile. So what ends up happening is with pressure over here, the molding wants to roll and turn this way. So one thing that I could do is I could add some blocking at that angle on the bottom of the uh, sides of the fence to fully support the workpiece going through and to keep it from rolling. I think it would still roll. So with this profile, I would need something to hang over and like hook onto this side and hold this side down to keep it from rolling um, anymore. But um, through my tests, what I can do is run this in three passes and have my last pass end up where it makes one pass where there's enough meat over here still, where it's still in plane with this area of the profile, keeping it from rolling and that's my final pass. So it's gonna be three passes. And the other kind of weird thing with this is the first pass is pretty heavy because I cannot, the, the knives stick so far down past the rollers that for the rollers to actually engage, the first cut has to be like pretty significant. So it seems like this is the last one I did. It, it works out just fine that heavy first pass, some kind of intermediate pass, and then I land up or I end up at my final pass, which is a final, final pass. This can never go through again with these fences and this setup without creating some additional support to keep this thing you know, from rolling. But it's, it's crown molding. <laughs> Kind of weird to think that I made crown molding. <laughs> uh, so I did try one experiment. I tried to do it in two passes 
and I was getting a lot of burning on here. I was just a little too much. The feed speed had to be too low to not burn, which I'm painting this, so I guess it doesn't really matter, but that much heat with the knives and everything, this doesn't make me too happy. So three passes worked out okay, except that last pass because the feed rollers, the outfeed rollers, are only contacting on these two little points right here. There's a high tendency for these pieces to vibrate and chatter. So I found that just applying pressure on the outfeed side just helped to hold the, uh, the workpiece down a little more in addition to the rollers. And that really helped to get rid of a lot of the chatter. So uh, let's head up to the barn and we'll do a little prep work and start getting these things ugh, painted. But that's, uh, that's crown molding, I guess. And again, big thank you to Donovan for lending me the, the molding machine for uh, actually being able to run all this stuff. <sighs> we got eight of these and then the two long ones. So I made extras just in case. And so far, no issues, but we haven't accounted for my potential miscuts. <laughs> so at this point, I'm not actually gonna do a whole lot of sanding. I'm also just gonna go over everything, knock down any kind of weird fuzziness to the grain. On the edges, I have a little extra bit of material there that needs to come off. So I'll clean that up, break the other uh, back corner that's gonna go against the ceiling and just really light scuff sanding just to clean it up because the primer is gonna help me level the surface. And it's gonna be difficult to show now to the camera any little undulation and the perfection of the, like the cove, most of the cove. The cove is gonna show all these errors, <laughs> all these little chatter marks it's gonna be really easy and obvious to show you the cut quality after my first cut of primer. So um, I'll be spraying that on and it's definitely too windy to spray outside today, but I'm gonna do it anyway because uh, I don't really care what the surface quality is of the finish because it's just primer. Most of it gets sanded away because I'm basically using the primer to fill in all the low spots that are left by the cutter. I just finished sanding these. Let's take a closer look at the, uh, the surface. So I was actually pretty surprised as I sanded this, how little or how small a lot of the chatter marks are. So this is one example of some of just the machine marks. This is not necessarily chatter. That's just the, uh, the scooping nature of those knives. They scoop as the machines run the board past it. So you always have a little bit of a dish as the knife comes around to make the next cut. Uh, the actual chatter, so there we can see a little bit of chatter marks in there the dark white lines those are all of the low spots and then the kind of gray areas are the areas where i've sanded through the primer to the wood so there's like a pretty big low spot here with the high spot there but overall not as bad as i thought it was going to be that little machine did a decent job <laughs> like surprisingly good job like, this is probably one of the worst ones i think it's got some of the most amount of mill marks and this huge chatter spot here and here. This is actually where a knot was. It's covered up. There's a knot right there. There was a knot right there. So that's, yeah, it's kind of a good low spot, but this first step with the primer is really just to fill in the low spots and then we can start building up from there. So I'm gonna spray all these again and then go to bed. <laughs> And I'll see you tomorrow for some more sanding. And uh, we should be able to get the top coat on tomorrow. The first coat of top coat before we can actually go on into the house and be installed onto the walls. It's looking a lot better than I was before. And you really, I can't even feel this anymore. So with the top coat, that should be all resolved. And that's kind of the bigger stuff on the ends. Out in the middle, there's not really a whole lot left. This one here is probably the worst. You can still see a little bit of that uh, locking in the cut. A few 
spots here and there. There's a few low spots there that are now nice and filled in. That's a knot <laughs> that I didn't fill very well. But uh, okay, second coat's done. So spray the top coat and then these can cure out for a bit and then we'll see how they go in during the install. So there is the completed crown molding ready to go up onto uh, the wall or whatever. I've never done this before and it was an interesting experience. One of those things just like there's a lot going on, a lot of things to consider and, and think about and learn as you go, but once you do it once, it suddenly all clicks and, and makes sense. So next time we'll get the crown molding installed in the sunroom and that'll be well, some of the last bits of trim before that room is done. It's like real crown molding. <laughs> Weird. So that's going to do it for this one. Thank you as always for watching. I greatly appreciate it. If you have any questions or comments on this thing, whatever this is, crown molding, <laughs> please feel free to leave me a comment. As always, I'd be happy to answer your questions you might have. And until next time, <laughs> happy woodworking. It's a it's crown. It's crown molding. Whew. Have a good day.